in a few weeks in our prayers also. <clears throat> Do we have any prayers from the congregation request? Yes. And who was that? Oh, okay. We want to keep Betty in our prayers. We're not sure what's wrong, but we want to keep her in our prayers. Okay. Oh, yes. This is praise, and we have both Sue and Candace Patterson here and also Elsie today. Amen. 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 Amen, and welcome back. Okay. Yes, um, Bill. I'd like for us to remember my niece's husband, Mikey Chandler. He was found uh, with no heartbeat, no breathing. Uh, they brought him back, took him to the hospital. They've got him in um, um, cooling his body down to try and get the brain slowing down. Uh, but he would prefer. This is your nephew? It's my niece's husband, Mikey Chandler. Bill's niece's husband, Mikey Chandler, was found without a heartbeat, and they are trying to trying to make some progress of getting him back. Is that correct? Okay. Anyone else? Who is that? Yes, Wayne Martin. They have COVID. Okay. Okay. Let's keep them in our prayers also. And also, do we have any unspoken? Oh, I'm sorry. So you're saying that when the Bible ministries have come in with prison ministry, that the suicide rate goes down tremendously. Due to COVID, they had stopped, yes. Absolutely. Our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Absolutely. Okay. If there's no other announcements. Absolutely. Thank you, Carolyn. The people that have been flooded down in eastern Kentucky. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Am I missing anyone else? Okay. Well, it is time, if you can kneel where you are, please do. And if you would like to come down to our garden of prayer, if you have a heavier burden on your heart, please do so.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we've had a lot of people come to you with many requests, many problems, many issues of this dark world. Lord, Satan loves to see all of this. It just makes him smile. Lord, help us keep our focus on you, your son. Help us keep us focused on your face and your glory. Let everything of this earth become dim. And Lord, please help each of these individuals. You know what they need before they've asked. You know what they need and they don't even know themselves. Lord, we ask that you please be with each one of these individuals. And please bring them back to worship with us. And Lord, as you come, please come quickly. Amen. Okay, we will now have a very short video. The offering today will be for the local church budget. As you all have heard many, many times, please put your tithes and loose offerings in the box as you come in the door at the back. Okay. Lord, I ask that you please direction us on how to spend your money. It's not just the 10%, it's all yours. Please help us be good stewards. Give us the wisdom to know what and what not to do with your money. Everything is yours, Lord. Please give us the guidance and the wisdom to follow. Through your son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, now it's time for the children's story. And because of the illness, we do have my wife, Debbie, doing the children's story. Okay. Uh, let's see. The collection today from the children will be for the Family and Youth Fund. Okay.
happy Sabbath. How are you ladies today? Good. Did you have a good week? I want to put a little plug in for Christian education after the story we heard that Becky read. You know, our little church school, though small, had wonderful warm hearts that passed through it. And it's wonderful to hear the stories return home of how God has blessed these people. So continue to keep Christian education in your prayers. And for those who had the privilege of Christian education that might have drifted away to bring them back to God. Well, today I've got a story. We got put on the impromptu uh, list. And um, I'm going to tell a story about one of the critters that we have at the house. Uh, we have a new one that's arrived, and Leighton named her Suge. It's a little raccoon. And Suge started coming around in the afternoon hours, and everybody said, oh, she's dangerous, she's dangerous. But we noticed that she was collecting a lot of the sunflower seeds and different things and bread, and it looked like she was carrying them off. So we thought, hmm, maybe she has some babies. And sure enough, we saw these little babies way up in the forest, but they weren't coming down to the patio. Well, about two weeks ago or a week ago, Leighton looked, and there's Suge with four of her babies. And I don't know if you can see the one that's looking down, but he's the mischievous one we've decided. So as, they, as Leighton was watching them, she noticed that Suge started bringing them down to the house, and we had the sunflower seeds out, but Leighton decided she was going to get some bananas and put out there with Suge. So... Leighton's been taught, and so is Laurel. You have to be careful because these little creatures are wild, and their instinctiveness tells them humans are dangerous, so I always have told them, be careful. They might look cute, and you might want to grab them, but they could probably tear you up pretty good. So she was being very careful, and uh, she started throwing the uh, bananas down, and they started coming close to her. And she's like, oh, my goodness, okay, I have to be careful. And she goes, you know, Mom, I kind of got them pushed out to where they went back on the wall with the sunflower seeds. And she goes, I looked, and there's one that was not being good. And Suge pushed her paw down on its head and pinned him to the ground like she was scolding him, kind of like moms do when you all get in trouble, you know. I don't think we pin yet. Well, at least I've never pinned my kids to the ground. But, you know, she, was, she, she saw danger. And she was telling her baby no. So Leighton said that this little one kind of went in front of Suge and kind of stayed away from mom for a while. But she continued to feed him. And now Leighton will sit outside and she'll be deep in her studies. Or Laurel will go out and not be paying attention. And there's Suge just staring at him. So we have a little family of raccoons that come to visit us. And that made me think today of the protection we have from our Father in Heaven. You know, He lets us see things through nature that shows His character. And it is through the book of nature that we can learn how the love of God is for us. It's like when you do something wrong and your mom tell, your dad tells you don't do it or you get punished. But sometimes we'll let you do something wrong so you can learn that with the wrongdoing, there's consequences. Just like Suge did with her little one. She brought her babies down to where she now feels safe. Might be a little too safe for our comfort, but she comes down and we're able to enjoy her and we embrace the lessons that she's been teaching us. But it also makes me realize that Jesus, he gives us choices to make and sometimes they're bad choices, but sometimes we can learn lessons from those choices that we have made if they're wrong. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 6, 6 through 8, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provision in summer and gather its food at harvest. That kind of applies to us. We need to start preparing ourselves. Study the word of God. Stay in prayer. 
spread his word to others. And sometimes it doesn't have to be just reading them a Bible verse. It might be sharing a banana with them once in a while too. <laughs> so let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, Lord, I lift these children up to you and I thank you for their smiles and their, their beauty that they teach us as adults. The innocence that we see in these children, Lord, that you've placed in their hearts. Lord, I pray that as they walk with you and as they grow towards you, that they will be a light for you, Jesus. Be with them throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may go. I want to thank Debbie for the children's story and also for filling in at the last minute. Do have one footnote to that story that she didn't mention is that Suge will be sitting out eating in the evening and you don't want to just walk out without turning the lights on because Suge was sitting out many times sitting on the wall and sitting right beside her uh, two inches away is her friend the skunk. So you, you do want to look and see what's out there before you go. <laughs> okay. Let's see, now it's time for special music with Bill Kidd. Thank you, Bill. Well, I don't see the mic, so I'll just use this mic. Oh, I do see now. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. Red can't explain. Yeah. 
It's always a blessing to have you sing special music. Okay. Our call today is worship is from Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, for ye know not neither the day nor the hour where the Son of Man cometh. At this time, let us welcome Abner Rodriguez with the message, What's Your Gift? Good morning, church. Can you read the sound a little? Thank you. Happy Sabbath. It's always good to be among God's saints. Amen? Seeing some familiar faces and seeing some new faces. And seeing some faces that we hadn't seen in a while. Which I'm really happy to see again. Carolyn, it's so beautiful to have your daughter here with you and her son. Welcome again. And um, Brother Todd, your son is back again. Praise the Lord. Yeah, and for the first time in my life, I get to meet Miss Sue Patterson. Um, I've heard so much about you guys, and and we were praying for your husband. We thank him for all of the work, all the effort that he put in ministry, and lifting up the name of Jesus. But you know, I'm also very grateful to see a good friend of mine here. I've been studying with this young man. His name is Will. He's my friend. And Will is here this morning with us for the first time. And I'm so happy to see you here, Will. Thank you for coming. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I know there's a lot to, to, to unpack from this verse. But I'm not the one responsible for doing the unpacking, Lord. That's you. And I just pray and ask in the name of Jesus that you guide my words, you guide my mouth, you guide my mind, you guide my heart, so that your Holy Spirit can be felt this morning here in this place. Let us have an encounter with you, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you speak through me so that others may come to know you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to ask a question. Anybody? Who, well, I'm going to say this primarily for the visitors who haven't been here. My sermons are interactive. That means I ask questions and I give you an opportunity to answer. Okay? So, for the first time in a very long time, I'm going to come down. I don't like being up there, to be honest with you. It, it doesn't suit me. I like being with you guys. And my question this morning is, what's your gift? What's, let, me, let me rephrase that. What's your contribution to the Lord? What's teaching? Awesome. Um, Jimmy, what's your contribution to the Lord? Working. Hey, you know, we need some, some good workers here, you know. Um, and that's an important thing. I want to pick on somebody young. So, Laurel, what's your contribution to God? Being a student. Well, you know what they say. Um, you've got to learn before you can lead, right? Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Carolyn, what's your contribution to God? Trying to do things for other people. You've got more than one, by the way. That's more than one gift. But you know, what's so important about this message is <clears throat> the question stems, what is your gift? See, because some people think 
that I'm a good storyteller. As a matter of fact, I, I received a message um, the day before asking me, would I do the children's story? Thank you, Miss Debbie, for pitch hitting for me. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you right now, I am not a good storyteller with kids. I'm sorry. And when I said that, somebody said, well, pastor, you do a good job at, you know, when you, when, when, you, when you preach, you do a good job. I said, preaching is one thing. Talking to kids is another. Isn't that right, Teresa? Yeah, because poor little thing. I, I see her every, every Sabbath that I'm here. I say, hi, Teresa. She's like, <sighs> I don't know why, but I scare kids. <laughs> so I might not be the good person, Miss Becky. I'm just giving you a heads up. <laughs> But this is incredible because I have a question, and that question in my mind, you know, by the way, I don't answer my own questions, okay? Because that would be just too weird. You know, they say that if, if, if you answer your own question, something's wrong, right? So I had a question in my mind. And um, that question was, what does God expect from me? How many of us have ever asked ourselves that question? Honestly. Right? Okay, so we've got a couple of people in the congregation. Yeah, you know, and it's a good question to ask yourself. So when I asked myself that question, this is where the Lord drew me to. The Lord drew me to Matthew chapter 25. And I've been studying Matthew 24 and 25 because of end times event. And, and you know, the first thing that Jesus comes up with is this amazing parable about the ten virgins. And, and I heard a sermon this week as I was traveling. I heard the sermon on, on the ten virgins. That the ten virgins represent ten churches that are pure, have not sinned, have not defiled themselves. And I said, hmm, okay. I can see that concept, but I can also, comparing it to today, that's not very true. Right? Because I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but even in Adventism, we've defiled ourselves, right? Come on, let's be real. I've been asked to speak the truth, so I'm going to speak the truth, whether we like it or not. It's the truth. We've defiled ourselves. Well, Pastor, how have we defiled ourselves? Well, number one, we've defiled ourselves with the Word of God. Because I can guarantee you that not every person that is in here every morning wakes up and before they even crawl out of bed, the first thing that they do is that their knees hit the floor and they pray. And then the second thing that they do is that they'll go to their dining room table or their breakfast nook and they'll open up their devotional. We've defiled ourselves. And if you, you understand what the Apostle Paul says in Romans, he says, all have fallen what? Oops. So have we or have we not defiled ourselves? I'll answer that question for you. We have. But I'm not talking this morning about the ten virgins. I'm talking about what follows afterward. I want you to go with me to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 25. And I'm actually looking, from, starting from verse 13. 13 is, is our scripture reading this morning. And, and my version, I read out of the Good News Translation. And, 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 it, and it shows a sense of urgency. Peter, you did a wonderful job. But right now, I'm trying to teach us we have a sense of urgency. But what's your urgency? Jesus We're dying. What's your urgency? Jesus is coming again. And guess what? Because Jesus is coming again, and we know He's coming again, we are more focused on things that separate us than things that unite us. We like to criticize what we don't agree with. Oh, watch out, Pastor. You might be getting into uncharted territories. That's my responsibility. My responsibility is to give you guys a message that will wake up the church of God. 
See, because we've been sleeping for far too long. You remember when Brother Scott Jones came and he did an entire series on the Laodicean church? We still think that the Laodicean church is other denominations out there and we can't see that we are sleeping and slumbering ourselves. God did not call me to be a pastor to tell you what a great job you're doing alone. God put me in this position to give you guys and to give myself a sense of urgency. And my version says, and I'm going to read it, because this is incredible. Jesus had just talked about the ten virgins. And then the Bible says, and Jesus concluded. So in other words, when he was talking to them about the ten virgins, and of what would happen throughout the past millions of years, or thousands of years, not millions, I'm sorry, what would happen at the end of time, Jesus is now beginning to conclude his message. And he says to us, watch out. Now I don't know about you, but when I read something in the Bible that says, watch out, that gives me a sense of urgency. That tells me something is wrong. And it says, watch out then. Because you, not me, you do not know the hour nor the day when the Son of Man will return. And, and I, I love this because I, I, I love reading about prophecy. I love hearing more about prophecy. I, 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 I'll be honest with you, I get entertained whenever I see people um, date setting. I love that. There's a guy this past week who um, contacted me and he said, Pastor, do you know that we roughly have about seven or eight months before crucibles and bad things begin to happen in this world. Then I started thinking to myself, if I have six to eight months before bad things begin to happen, what did I call all last week? Because last week I had a rough week. Last week, I had to take my family down to Florida so that my wife could take care of her mother. And then I had to travel all by myself. <laughs> I'm a big boy now. <laughs> so I don't need mom to come to the, to the airport and wait for me and say, son, welcome home. <laughs> but every day, we've got bad things happening. Every day, more and more, we hear bad things happening. And this guy is dating, predicting that in six to eight months, bad things are going to begin to happen? Listen, I, I felt like asking him, I don't know what rock you just crawled out of, but, you know, bad things have been happening now for a while. And when you hear words like, be careful, take note, oh, this is my favorite one because the King James says that, take heed. You know, we got, I got to throw in the eloquence there. Take heed, Carolyn. Be strong. Automatically, we know we got to watch out because something bad is about to happen. It's almost like you're walking across the street. You remember this when you were a little kid? And your parents would tell you, make sure you look both ways, right? I remember one time I was trying, to, we were, it was at a Pathfinder event. And, um, we were doing a car wash, and I thought I had looked correctly, but I pulled out in front of a car, and a car almost hit me, and somebody just said, watch out! See, because when we see danger, we don't just say, watch out. Right? Miss Judy? Whenever you see Henry doing something, Henry, watch out! Right? How am I doing? <laughs> 
Because there's a sense of urgency. And I don't know about this, but every time we read the Word of God, we cannot see God's sense of urgency. We want to read the Bible so monotone instead of reading it in real life. Because we're afraid that if we interpret it the way Jesus says it, I'm in trouble. Guess what? You are in trouble. We're all in trouble. And then verse 14 of Matthew chapter 25. Strong comparison. Because verse 14, my version says, and I want you to read it on your own. No, as a matter of fact. Um, let me see. Miss Carolyn, I want you to read verse 14 of Matthew 25. Read it loud. Jesus is doing a comparison. Do you understand that the same comparison is ratified and it's confirmed in Revelations chapter 22? I'm going to show it to you. My version says, at that point in time, the kingdom of heaven, this is important because we're not talking about earthly things. Okay? You know, the children of Israel desire deeply to have a land where they can see milk and honey flowing. And, and for many years, 500 years, they were enslaved. And as they were enslaved, that desire grew more and more every day. But how come our desire to see Jesus come does not grow more and more every day. Can somebody please explain that to me? Because I can't understand it. We look forward to our children graduating from school. We look forward to retirement, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Okay? We look forward to retirement, and we look forward to doing so many projects, but we don't look forward to seeing Jesus come again. I got a text message last night from a colleague that I used to work with in Texas. He said, this Sabbath is my last Sabbath. I am retiring after this Sabbath. And I said, praise the Lord. But I had to ask the question, what are you going to do with the time, the gifts and the talents that God has given you? And he said to me, well, I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm not going to be worrying about preaching anymore. This was a pastor. He said, I have preached for over 30 years. I'm done preaching. Someone told me this week, pastors don't retire. They just change jobs. <laughs> You're no longer leading out in a church. Now you become an elder or something, right? You can never just sit there and hear a sermon as a preacher. We want to imitate our congregation instead of inspiring our congregation to imitate us, to imitate Jesus. And this is what Jesus was talking about right here. He said, look, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who was about to leave home. In the Greek, it makes reference to two things. Number one, it talks about a man who had a lot of possessions and he was going home. But then it also talks about that same man leaving his home. And I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus has dual citizenship. I know you can't see it right now. But Jesus had dual suit house because it hasn't gone anywhere. Jesus has dual citizenship. He's a citizen of two worlds. Jesus is a citizen of this earthly world, but Jesus is also a citizen, a citizen of the heavenly world. And this servant that Jesus was talking about, it was himself. He wasn't talking about anybody else. He was giving a parable. He was giving an explanation, a story. 
And in that story, he threw himself in the middle of everything. It says, it is like a man who prepared himself. He gathered all of his servants. And there were actually just three. Just three. And let's read a little further because um, verse 15 says, He gave each one of them according to his, their ability. It says his ability, but in the Greek it's their ability, their knowledge, their understanding, and their willingness to work. So if you ask yourself, how come the Lord doesn't use me for something? I want to ask you, what are you good at? Because God already wants to use you. It's up to you whether you want to be used by Him or not. And it says here in verse 15, He gave each one according to His ability. To one He gave 5,000 gold coins. In your, in, in your translation it says talents. Talents has dual explanation in the Greek. Talent has a monetary value. But talent also has an outward expression of faith and of love. Some people have a talent. Bill, you have a talent to sing. Rana has a talent to sing. Judy, you have a talent to play the organ and the piano. I don't, I don't, I can touch the organ and the piano. I can't play it. Carolyn, you have a talent to play the piano. Uh, Philip, you have a talent to be a great leader and a wonderful economist. Um, Peter, you have the talent of managing money. And all of these things God has given to us so that if what we do, what we use it for, we may honor and glorify Him. And sometimes we walk into a church and we say, I don't know if they could use me here. Let me dismiss that for you right here, right now. If God brought you into His house, not mine, His house of worship is because He wants to use you. See, it's always nice to hear the pastor preach, give a good message that will encourage, but God wants you to give that message of encouragement too. Because the pastor is not the only one that has something to say. God gave you a gift. He gave you a talent. He put an economic, monetary value on that. So to one, he gave five. To the second, he gave how many? And to the last one, how many did he give? Just one. And you know what? I'm here to tell you today that a good majority of us think that that's the only gift and the only talent that we have. We only got one. Jojo, do you ever feel that way? Like you only have one gift, one talent, that you can give to the Lord. Stop thinking that way. You want to know why? Because you're a good woman. You're a good mother. You're a good friend. You're a good listener, even though you read lips. But you've got gifts. You've got talents. You're good with your hands. You've got a tremendous heart. I've already named off six talents that God has given you. Do you understand what I'm saying? And believe it or not, sometimes we put value on ourselves based on what we think we can or cannot do. Am I right? See, I've heard it all. Especially during nominating committee time. Oh, pastor. I'm so flattered that you would ask me. <laughs> I'm not really good at becoming a deacon. What? What do you mean you're not good at being a deacon? No, no, no. <laughs> being a deacon is not... I'll help out here and there whenever you ask me. But I don't... I, I, that's not my gift. 
And I love it when people say that because I immediately, I begin to challenge them. So what is your gift? I, I don't know. I mean, I, mm, I don't know. You know, and it's interesting because the Bible tells me that when Christ returns, he's going to look at you and he's going to say, what did you do with the gifts and the talents that I gave you? I'm jumping ahead of myself, I know, but this is important here. He's not going to ask you, hey, so Abner, what were you really good at? Because every perfect gift comes from the hand of God. It has nothing to do with you. It's about how you can reach other people through the gifts and the service that He's placed in your heart to do. Oh, but we like to ignore that though. Jesus compares Himself to that Master. That Master who left our presence on His trip. Please rest assured, he's not going to be gone for very long because Jesus, the master, is coming again. No, wait, I, no, you didn't hear me. I'm gonna, I got to say this one more time. And I want you to say it with conviction. Jesus, the master, is coming again. You got to believe that. It's in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. I'm not reading anything that does. It's not stated in here. But we think, like that one servant, I got time. I mean, I got plenty of time because, like, right now, <laughs> I mean, the world's in chaos and everything. There's wars and there's rumors of war, but I got time. <laughs> And sometimes we got so much time because we feel like we're not ready. Please forgive me. How dare us as Christians think that Jesus is not coming back soon? How dare us think that we still have, I don't know, maybe 20 more years on this earth? I had one person ask me, so have you started making plans for your wife's wedding, for your daughter's wedding? I was like, what wedding? <laughs> Does she have a boyfriend I don't know about? I wanted to call my wife right then and there and say, is there something you need to tell me that I need to know about? No, 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 you got to make plans for the future. Like, you, you got to find out, how are you going to pay for this wedding? And I, I said... Jesus is going to pay for the wedding because he's going to be here before she gets married. And I'll have to spend another single cent on that. <laughs> You're really waiting on that. I said, no, I'm not just waiting on that. I'm banking on that promise. And I will put my whole salary that Jesus is coming again. See, because what I have here doesn't matter. What matters is what I have up there. What matters is that I make it up there. And this is incredible because there are two very important focal positions that we need to analyze today. Number one, the master left, but he's returning. Number two, he has given to those that he has left behind precious tokens that remind us of the special gifts that are to be carried out for his purpose, not yours. Not yours. We're going to get into the spiritual gifts, but that's not going to happen today. See, because every time we talk about spiritual gifts, people get it so confused because they think, well, I, I can't give a Bible study. If you can't give a Bible study, why don't you follow me? Why don't you come with me to one? But no, it feels good to have everybody else do your work instead of you learning how to share the Master with someone. And if I offend you with my words, they're not mine. They're in the Bible. 
If you have a problem with it, you take it up with God, not with me. And yes, I mean it. Because I'll never tell you anything that is not in the word of God. And if it stumps your toe, so be it. Maybe it'll help wake you up a little. My feet should be put in a boot or in a cast so many times that I've stumped my toes. Or that Jesus, God, has stumped my toes. But you know what? He straightens them out. Flex my feet a little, move them around, and I keep on marching. Why? Because I'm here to do His will, not yours. And in verses 16 to 18, this is, this is hard right here. This is hardcore right here. Because it says, Then the servant, when, when Jesus returned, when the master returned, then the servant who had received 5,000 coins went at once and invested that money and he earned 5,000 more. This is before Jesus comes back. He took what God had given him, he invested it, and he duplicated his efforts. Then the one, in the same way, the servant who had received two, went and he earned another two. Then verse 18 says, But the servant who had received only one went off, took a shovel, dug a hole, and did what? <laughs> I'm even afraid to ask this question, but how many holes have you dug? Trying to hide what God has given you. How many of us are understanding me today? Stop digging holes. Maybe that should have been the title of this morning's message. Stop digging holes. But God gave me something else because he needed the title to be appeasing. Not to just be anything, any random thing that is being said out there. But we're so busy digging holes and burying what God has given us in hopes that one day we may still be found faithful. And what we're doing is we're lacking in faithfulness instead of being a servant of the Most High. See, the Bible says He called His servants. He didn't just call random people. He called His servants. You are a servant of God. And He's given you something so that you can share what He has done with someone else. I don't know what this parable is telling you. But I can always tell you what my interpretation is. There are three servants in this parable. The first one was responsible. The second one was also very responsible. But the third one was a fool. Can you say that word? Say it with me. Fool. No, 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 no. You got to say it like you mean it. Say it with me. Fool. That's exactly what we are today religiously. We talk so much about the Pharisees and we criticize them. But guess what? We are spiritual fools. I'm sorry. Maybe that's not the most appropriate word. But this is what the Bible says. The Bible says we are being spiritually foolish. Why? Well, I don't know about that, Pastor. I, I, I think I do pretty good at returning my tithes and my offerings. I know my tithes, for sure, for sure, I give, right? Because you've got to return the tithes. The offerings, I guess it kind of depends upon what department I'm really fond of. And God is going to hold us accountable to that. That's why I say we are being spiritually foolish. Verse 19 says, After a long time, the master... Oof. Philip, won't you go ahead and read verse 19, please? Yes. Matthew chapter 25, verse 19. The master returned. 
The one that you taught, the, the one that you thought would not come back. The one that left you in charge. The one that gave you gifts. The one that paid you for those gifts. He returned. He came back. And guess what? Now, instead of a welcoming parade, it was now a day of reckoning. There is a day of reckoning that is coming. Whether you like it, whether you know it, or not. You can't say that you don't know it because I just said it. There is a day of reckoning that is coming. And you and I are going to have to stand before the Lord and He's going to ask you, what did you do with the gifts and the talents that I gave you? How did my reward pay off for you? Did you invest it wisely? Or were you selfish in sharing the gospel? You know, sharing the gospel doesn't necessarily mean standing up here and preaching. I'll tell you right now, and I've said this many times before. The most powerful sermon you, you, will ever preach is not from this pulpit. It's with your hands with the gifts that God has given you and how you shared that gift with other people. How you've lightened their load so that they can see Jesus in you. Because if they can't see Jesus in you, they definitely cannot hear the Jesus in you. You understand what I'm saying? Talk is cheap. That's why Jesus gave them talents. Talentos in the Greek. And it weighed, it was worth a lot of money. My version says it was worth a thousand dollars compared to our translation. So the one that he gave five, he went back and he said, Lord, you gave me five, I gave you five more. <laughs> As an investor, if I double my money, Peter, are you going to be happy or are you going to be sad? I'm going to tell you right now, if I double my money, I'm going to be very happy. You know? And if you double your efforts for the Lord, the Lord is going to be very happy with you. Look, look, look at what the Bible says. Okay? Verse 20. The servant who had 5,000 coins came in and handed over another 5,000. He said, you gave me 5,000, sir. Here, he said... Look, here are another 5,000 that I have earned. And in verse 21, this is the response of, of, the, of the master. He says, well, what? Well done. But he didn't stop there. He said, well done. You are a good and a faithful servant, said his master. You have been faithful in managing small things, and I will place you in charge of larger things. Come. Come on in and share in my happiness. You get it? What you do for the Lord makes Him happy. It doesn't have to make your neighbor happy. It doesn't even have to make your pastor happy. It has to make God happy. Because Jesus was the one that died for you. It wasn't me. And though we go out there and we see a lot of conference officials looking for pumps and circumstances. Don't worry. Work for the master. Work while the night is coming. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go back. Okay. So, <laughs> here we go. Verse 22. Then the servant who had, give, who had been given two coins came in and said, You gave me 2,000 coins, sir. Here, look. I have brought another 2,000 that I have earned. And then he says to him, Well done. You've been a good and a faithful servant. 
You've been faithful in managing small amounts, and I will put you in charge of, law, of large amounts. Come in and share in my happiness. Now, verse 24 really makes me sad. Because verse 24, can I say this before I go in there? I've never met a good Adventist that doesn't have a good excuse. Am I picking on Adventists? Yes, I am, because we are the remnant people of God. The Bible says that God has a remnant people. You've got to get out of your mind that the church completely is going to be saved, because there will be people beside you that you will not see in heaven. He's not coming back for a church. He's coming back for a people. Do you put together and comprise a church? Yes, we are a church. We are a church family. But God's not just coming back for you. And there are people that are sitting beside you that, unfortunately, if they don't make the right choice today, they're not going to be there. Verse 24. Then the servant who had received 1,000 coins came and said, Sir, you know, and the funny thing is I can see this happening, you know. He, he probably fixed himself before coming to the master and he says, Okay, do I, look, do I look okay? Am I dressed to impress? Okay, all right. He comes in and he walks in and he says, <clears throat> Sir, <laughs> I just wanted you to know. I know the kind of God that you are, okay? So I did the smart thing, okay? I, hold that thought now. It's coming, okay? So this is what I did, just because I know it's you, okay? I buried it. <laughs> and then he walks away like it's a victory lap. Oh, look what happens here. You reap harvest where you didn't plant. And you gather crops where you never spread seeds. But then he says something very interesting. In verse 25. Um, let me see. Who, ha who else has the Bible? Rana, go ahead and read verse 25 for me, please, of Matthew chapter 25. I'm stuck. I'm stuck on the phrase where he says, I was afraid. I was scared. If God is an all-loving God, what are you afraid of? If the God you serve is compassionate, what are you afraid of? If the God that you pray to every morning or every night or before every meal is love, what are you afraid of? Are you really scared? Or are you confused? Those are two different things. But guess what? The end result is the same. Verse 26 says, You're bad. No, no, you aren't just bad. You're a lazy servant. I don't know about you, but I can't handle God telling me I'm a lazy servant. I can't. Because then he says, I'm going to take your excuse and I'm going to explain it to you. You knew I reap harvests where I didn't plant and I gather crops where I didn't spread seeds. Well, then... You should have deposited my money in the bank. And I would have received it all back with interest when I returned. Explanation? You should have given it to the world instead. 
instead of hiding the gifts, the wonderful things that you can do for people, if you don't want to do it for God, do it for the world. And the reason why Jesus says that is because he hopes that in some way, shape, or form, even though you've been wicked, you've been lazy, the hope is that they will see Jesus through what you do. I believe that at that point in time, this servant finally understood that the whole panoramic picture was they weren't supposed to see me in the first place. They were supposed to see Jesus in me. Verse 27 says, let me go to verse 28, excuse me. Because this is what's going to happen. Now, take the money away from him and give it to the one who has 10,000 coins. Verse 29. For every person who has something, even more will be given. And he will have more than enough. But the person who has nothing, even the little that he has, will be taken away from him. And verse 30 says, As for this, this is, this is the reason why Jesus called him a useless and a lazy person person. He said, as for this useless servant, throw him outside in the darkness where there will be crying and gnashing of teeth. I told you guys about Revelations chapter 20, 22, right? Revelations chapter 22 Let me find it in my Bible. Starting from verse 18, my Bible says, And I, John, solemnly sworn, and I warn everyone who hears the prophetic words of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to their punishment the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the prophetic words of this book, God will take away from them their share of the fruit of the tree of life of the holy city, which are described in his book. Verse 20 says, He who gives his testimony to all this says, Yes, indeed, I come soon. So be it, Lord Jesus. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with everyone. And then verse 17 of Revelation 22 says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And everyone who hears this must also say, Come. Come whoever is thirsty and whoever wants the water of life as a gift, whoever wants it, come. And he says in verse 12, listen, I am coming soon. And I'm coming and I will bring my reward with me to give to each one according to what he or she has done. Does that explain everything? 
Is the Bible crystal clear? By the grace of God, I will never say something that will steer you in the opposite direction than what the Word of God says. I don't know, nor do I need to know, what gift and what talent you have received today. But you've got a decision to make. Because Jesus is still asking, what's your gift? To some it's preaching, to others it's teaching, to others it's discipleshipping, whatever it is. It's not for you to hide it. It's for you to share it. And this morning, I want to wrap up by telling you we need to learn to work for the night is coming. When you have it, please rise in the song 375. Let's pray. Father, first of all, forgive us. For, forgive us for our spiritual laziness, Lord. And forgive us for being so careless with the gifts and the talents that you've given us. Forgive us for doubting, Lord, or not thinking or believing that you would come again soon. This parable serves as a reminder that you are soon to return. But we've got work to do. Lord, I pray and I ask in the name of Jesus that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit. 
And as you do, fill us, Lord, with that desire to not just serve others, but to lift your name up with our actions and our words. Lord, as, as we depart from this place, may we be inspired to tell somebody about Jesus. Lord, may we take those gifts and those talents that you have given us, and instead of burying it, instead of being hole diggers, Lord, may we go out there and share what you have given us with the world so that they may know the one true God, Jesus Christ. Be with us, Lord, as we head out, Lord. Send us on our way to share the gospel message with someone. Be filled with your Holy Spirit so that we can hear you say, Well done, good and faithful servant. You put effort and you worked in little things, but I will place you among all things. Now come, join me, celebrate with me in what I have prepared for you. Thank you, Father. We ask and we pray that you will give us the privilege of hearing those words, but also experiencing Jesus. In his name, we humbly pray. Amen. Amen.